enthusiastic crowd to hear about the biomass heating system that we're proposing to put in this complex. So um, most of you know who I am. Um, my name is Ruth Miller and I'm the superintendent of schools. And I want to tell you, we have a graph up here and it's what uh, oil prices have done over the last, since 1999 to 2014. As you can see, it, it steadily grows up. So why, why are we doing this project? When I got here five years ago, it was clear that there were a lot of things that we have no control over in our budget. We have no control over our special ed costs. We have no control over our retiree health insurance costs. We have no uh, control over our unemployment costs. We have no um, control over our health insurance costs. There are so many things in our budget that we absolutely have no control over. So we looked at some things to say, how can we control the cost of heating this complex? And we found a way that we actually could control our costs. And so, can we, how do we turn to the next slide? Thanks. <laughs> <coughs> okay. I'm good. So let me show you that we just didn't um, come up with this in a very short period of time. We've been working on this for the last five years. So five years ago, a study and an evaluation analysis took place. We actually wrote three USDA grants. The first two, we didn't get. The third one, we actually did get to help support doing the schematic work for this project. Um, we paid for a feasibility study. We didn't want to, okay, we, we got this grant. We, don't, we wanted to make sure that we could save money doing this. We, so we commissioned Wilson Engineering to actually come out and do a study to prove to us whether this was going to be a project moving us in the right direction. And then after that was done, we also recently performed an energy audit to substantiate the feasibility study. So we really looked deeply and we used experts to make sure that the cost savings and the efficiencies are there. So what we're going to do now is, I just want to give you that background because I think some, there was a misperception out there that we just decided to go in this direction. Um, randomly and not over time. So I just wanted people to really understand this has been a five-year endeavor in an effort to control some of our expenses. I'd like to um, introduce um, Frank Kennedy, and he's the principal of the Owner's Project Manager firm that we're using for this project, and I will now turn it over to him. Frank? Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm with uh, Diversified Project Management. Uh, in the role of owner's project manager. So we're in charge of helping uh, with advice and consultation, uh, steering the, the whole the technical aspects of the project. And so uh, we have some materials to help explain uh, the feasibility and uh, the practicality of the project. And you can interrupt anytime with any questions. Um, first, a few slides. Uh, let me take the tour Monday, Tuesday. So uh, a few of the project team went to Keene, New Hampshire to look at a recently installed similar uh, wood chip fired boiler facility. And I just have a few pics. Uh, you saw the back side uh, in the first slide with the stack. And this is the front where the chips are actually loaded. It just looked like garage bays. And uh, these three pics, I'm apologizing in some few. <coughs> These are three picks of the, uh, the feeder system on the right conveyor belt, uh, auger drive uh, distribution, and to the far right, the actual boiler itself, and the ash, ash collection uh, barrel you see to the right of the boiler. The point being, very simple uh, technically. These are not that sophisticated uh, projects. This is uh, wood chips coming up a conveyor belt and into a hopper. That was a little quick video. And we have another one that just shows its transport from, from the main uh, storage on into the boiler facility. So you can actually see what wood chips look like. Do you make the chip yourself? No, we will buy chips. We'll buy the chips. 
so there's not a chipper included into it? There is equipment that will reduce in size and comb through for metals or contaminants. So there's a lot of equipment here, but it really comes as a, what's it called, a full, full chip? What do you, what do you oh, a whole it? tree chip. A whole tree chip. <coughs> so just uh, some of the economics. The um, estimate is that about 1,220 tons of chips would be needed for a typical heating season. Uh, they're about $30 a ton. That's a conservative number. So a total fuel cost of $36,600 for a year. We'll talk later why these numbers are here, but $3.2 million loan. If they were paying on a $3.2 million loan, the payment for that is $214,000 a year. Add to $36,000, you're looking at a $250,000 per year payment. Hang on. If we get the next grant, it's still in abeyance, and the loan is only $2.95 million. The annual total cost of the project would be $234,350 per year. And the bottom lines are what's most important, is the actual cost in fiscal year 13 was 261. And given the severity of this current heating season, it looks like it'll be about 350,000 for fuel this year, this fiscal year 2014. So you can see the cost of this project is far less than the actual fuel being spent in the most recent years. Yes, sir. What is the exact cost of that loan for the interest? The exact cost of the loan. Chip plus loan payment equals, so it's the 214. I don't know what he wants. Are, are you interested in what the bond rate is that yeah. calculates that payment? I'm interested in how much that loan is going to cost the house. You pay interest. You, you're getting a loan. You're going to pay money for that loan. Right? That's how correct. How much is that going to cost the town to borrow that money? Uh, yeah. the, the first dollar amount. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, I, I tried to make this slide a little simpler, but at, at 3.2 million, okay, that's with the money we have now. We're fairly confident we're going to get the 2.95 million, but we don't have it yet, so I wanted to give you both. The chips of 36,600, 36, okay, that's cost of chips. The loan amount is $214,000 a year, principal and interest. That was um, a recorded. That's principal and interest. That's principal and interest. And is that in that payment, or is that an, an excess of that payment? No, that's the total payment. With so the, what you see up there, with the, interest, the, with the interest, with, with the interest, with the interest, principal and interest, and that's the first year of the loan, and it will progressively go down. How, how many years of the loan? Um, the, this one is for a 25-year loan. And if you do a 2.95, it drops down to 197,750. And so you can see that we can more than cover that, which then we might consider dropping it down to a 20-year loan. We have rates for a 30-year loan, a 25-year loan, and a 20-year loan with, with, at 3.5 million, 3.2 million, and 2.95 million. Those are all really high numbers, but we wanted to make sure that if we move forward with this, no matter what scenario, we could cover it with our current oil usage. Does that answer your question? Not really. Not, I can give you the whole loan amortization schedule. Um, I will get you one and I'll give it to you. What I want to know is the exact cost of borrowing that money is going to be for the 25 years. Annually. No, not annually, the total cost. All right, I'll, I'll go down and get an amortization schedule and I'll hand it to you and it'll show you the total cost. Wouldn't it be 25 times? No, it won't. It's not that. <laughs> so the, the analysis used was based on the current 2014 uh, fuel, fuel oil costs of $3.90. This is from uh, the Mass Department of uh, Energy Conservation with a projection over the next 15 years of what's likely to occur for the cost of oil. So uh, 
those payback numbers that you saw in the earlier table were on today's rate. Obviously, the savings increase if oil does go to four, five, or six dollars uh, a gallon, or or more. That bond rate too is fixed. The bond rate is fixed. Yes. 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 And what's the percentage? Four percent. You know what the percentage rate is. Yeah, it will. It, it varies depending on what term you go. Right, yeah. I understand okay. that. 25 is one, 20 is another, right. 15, Four to 30, five percent. Excuse me? It's a range of 4 to 5 percent. Okay. So one reality is that the equipment that is utilized in the facility now is aged, it's been problematic, it needs repair, it's going to need replacement imminently. The cost to repair with like kind is in the range of half a million dollars. So a half a million dollar investment needs to be made regardless of a decision to go with an energy saving wood chip model. And this slide just sort of illustrates some of the installs that we've been involved in or aware of that kind of give us that, that $500,000 figure. How old is the boiler? 1998. So this right, right at the top of my next slide. So this will replace the heat for the whole, whole building or is this just a part of the building? Is this a the heat for the, the entire, for the entire facility, uh, excluding a small component that is for emergency, the propane oh, backup. backup right. 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 That's so uh, problematic installed uh, back in 1998, a replacement cost for a similar facility would be about a half a million dollars if we did not do wood chips. And the fuel savings with wood chips we're saying is about quarter of a million dollars a year. Uh, just to tag on some of what uh, the superintendent said, this was not a, a quick snap decision. This is the result of five years of study, uh, knowing that something does have to be done with uh, the input of experts in the design field that understand these systems and uh, with successful grants that have been uh, secured and more in the process. And there, we'll, we'll make this whole slideshow available on the website of the school. So there is a, a hyperlink that you can read more all about uh, biomass, uh, which have fired the systems on that sheet. So uh, if we don't know what we're talking about for wood chips, they are uh, small ground uh, components, uh, renewable, obviously, very sustainable. Uh, they could be secured right here in the local community, so the dollars of, of the energy are, are local. Uh, we're told by uh, the Forestry Division that they are available in abundance and that uh, we know historically they have been low cost and extremely stable, not, not the volatile situation that we've seen with fuel oils. What does the facility need? It's a handful of things. A fuel storage facility. So like the slide you saw of Keene, we basically need a bay that will house the chips uh, from delivery. We need access, so part of the parking lot has to be uh, planned to be able to swing a large truck in with a 40-yard delivery. A combustion equipment room, uh, the actual boiler itself, which is the major component. Fuel handling equipment, you saw the conveyor belts and equipment from the key, we'll have a system similar to that. Uh, chimney, obviously, and then environmental equipment which monitors and cleans uh, the emissions. An ash disposal system, which is a, a few barrels a season, and usually they get recycled uh, as fertilizer, and then a control system. And one of the themes I kind of want to leave you with is this is a very unsophisticated system. It's, it's high tech, but it is very simple in fact, you're looking at the control panel for the Keene, New Hampshire boiler in that picture. So it's not the big submarine uh, display giant control panel. It's very simple. Very simple diagram uh, from the association of, uh, of wood chip fire boilers. A small auger system delivers a material into a combustion chamber. It moves through a secondary zone for efficient and then a heat exchanger uh, where the, uh, the piping uh, exists that converts uh, that energy into hot water that gets distributed through uh, the building and then the chimney takes the exhaust out. 
an overall facility would look something like this. Ours would probably be even simpler. Uh, a whole field, a storage area with augers that drive the chips into a belt, into the boiler. And you can see very simple fan-induced draft for combustion and exhaust. So specifically, the impact of the facility will require a building addition. Uh, we propose it to be directly behind the existing boiler room. We'll reuse the existing boiler room for the new equipment. And it may look something like this in proportion. So you're seeing the existing boiler room below and a building addition, and that's pretty conservative. That's large, probably larger than we are actually going to need. We're, we're, as we're going through design, we're, we're honing in on those dimensions. And from the rear uh, elevation, uh, we'll have a large garage door type bay for delivery of the chips, similar to what you saw in the pictures of King, New Hampshire. A sort of a summary, why now and why wood chips? The bond rates are low, you just heard about 4%, and they were, they're were projected to increase. Construction costs for the building addition, you're still taking advantage of a, of a slumped economy, and that's not going to last. At some point, we're gonna push off and construction will return. Tremendous fuel cost savings, and you're already taking advantage of two and possibly even three grants that'll make the project even more feasible. This is sort of my piece. Did you yeah, want to do more by pictures? Yes. So these chips they bought from the people that are putting in the uh, unit. No, oh, the local, local landscaper is that. Excuse yes. me. <laughs> Just people can use the microphones of the um, people hearing, but also the tape. Right. Yeah, either in this, and you guys have to speak louder or use the mic for you questions. So I'm usually a pretty loud person, so anybody can't answer. So your, your question was where are the chips coming from? Yeah. So prior to the uh, during the start of this project, we researched to make sure there were chips available, and there are three large suppliers in the local area, yeah. but there's much more than that. So we, we want to make sure that we work on our own problem later on. But um, you can see, even from Keene, um, finding chips is not an issue at yeah. this point. So is there any state right uh, regulations or rules or so forth that if later on down the road, Templeton decided that they wanted to throw a wood chip out back and make its own chips, they could do that? You know what do chips, it's, it's, it's just wood chips. Not, it's well, not, I know they're just wood chips. Not, no, it's, what's that? I don't know, maybe I didn't your question. We, I don't know what's gonna happen as we get on the road and stuff. I didn't know if there was any state regulations or so forth on making or producing these chips that if we, Later on down the road, while the place closed, what if we ever needed to make the chips ourselves to uh, keep the furnace going? Is there anything that regulations and so forth that say we couldn't do that? No, there's no there's no regulations requiring anybody making chips, anybody to make chips. Yes, sir. Oh, the chips just get just regular. Is there any significant you know, like, difference you know, like, between the useful oil. life of a wood fire, this chip boiler, and the traditional oil fire? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Dan Wall from RDK Engineers. We're the uh, mechanical engineer to, to work on designing the system to kind of follow up on the Wilson study that was done last year. Uh, and answer your question, the uh, life expectancy of one of these boilers, they, they would be more than a, a typical commercial boiler. They're industrial in nature. They've come out of the pulp and paper industry, most of these manufacturers, and they kind of downsized them to get to this size boiler, but they still, still use a lot of the same materials and construction techniques and, the, and they're rated the same as the industrial style furnaces that you would see in much larger manufacturing plants. So I'm thinking that 30 to 35 year life expectancy where a regular commercial oil, oil fired boiler is 20 to 25. So they're a little bit longer than uh, what you would normally buy with the regular fossil fuel. Yes, sir. How many million hours per week would somebody be watching this? How many? What is the operating and maintenance? Yeah, can you like? restate the question so that we can hear? Sorry. Yeah, that is the big question. Yeah, restate the question. Bill. It was asked how many hours or how much manpower in terms of time would be would be needed dedicated solely to maintain the system. Am I am I correct that I closed? Uh, in all the biomass uh, 
sightings I've looked at. I've looked at 10 all over New England, and I attend a lot of conferences. Generally, an hour a day is a good nominal figure. There'll be a lot of days you'll go in and look at it. It can be set up that you can take care of it on a three-day schedule. On Fridays especially, clean things up, come back in on Monday and do a heavy clean. The mantra is, if you want to clean boiler room, spend the time each day. But that time is no more than an hour. You say eight hours a week, 10 hours a week, five hours a week? Yes, another question. What's the backup for if it breaks down? What, what is, does it go to something else? I mean, if we're in the middle of a winter and it breaks, what's the backup for that? So the question is, what if the equipment fails? What is what is Plan B? We'll, we'll go to the engineer first. So uh, for backup, we're proposing uh, two propane fire boilers. Uh, right now, you have the the oil fire boilers. We would want to get rid of those boilers. They're not quite at the end of their life expectancy, but they're getting there. Uh, the, you know, the underground tank is in the location where we want to put the chip building or the chip bin, the fuel storage facility. We're running out of this biomass boiler takes up quite a bit of space as you can imagine. They're just bigger devices than a typical boiler. So we're, in order to get everything to still fit within the confines of the existing boiler room, we're looking at vertical boilers, propane fired, uh, with a small propane tank, small, not, not a huge propane tank for backup in case the chip uh, wood fired system would have down. But it would be big enough to heat the whole school on a cold winter day. And is that included in all this cost, or is this something separate? I think it's included. It's included. Yeah. It, it is included? It is included, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is that propane boiler going to be used to fire the chips at all? No, those are totally separate and redundant systems. Right. The question was whether why, they... Why are you going to the expense of putting in a whole new system for new burners when you have two oil burners right now that can do the same job? Let me finish. And it's cheaper to replace those oil burners than put in a brand new propane type system. And it takes twice as much propane per BTU as it does oil. And what would the cost of that be per year added on to the expense of the BBC? Now I forgot your first question. I wanted to reiterate for the uh, for the sake of the table. What was the first question? Why can't we just use the same oil burners versus no, no, the, the propane? The first question was, were you going to use the, the, the oil, the gas, to fire the chips? You said no. Right. right. So, so I'm going to repeat that question so it gets on the tape. The question was uh, whether the propane uh, boiler was described is being used for combustion in the chamber of the wood chip fire boiler and the answer is no. They'll be totally separate uh, systems. Your follow-on question, sir, was then, uh, while there's an existing oil fire boiler and underground storage tank in existence, why are we considering replacement for the backup system in propane? And I think we can agree that uh, we all want to eliminate underground fuel storage tanks. And then the other element is that the existing equipment is nearing its useful life. Well, it, it would, to replace the two burners is much cheaper than putting a whole new propane system in one. And two, it takes twice as much propane per BTU as it does oil. It Correct. sounds like it would be cheap. In fact, our original plan was to keep boiler number one as the standard backup for the 15 cent energy portfolio we would need in the, in the shoulder months, fall and spring. However, what we looked at was the boilers themselves. They're meant to put out a constant stream of water, of hot water at 150 degrees or above to distribute. We have outside boiler re uh, reset with controls set up for those boiler resets. If it only puts out one temperature, that's a problem. What caused this problem? When we value engineered the building, a standard, high efficiency, inexpensive, straightforward boil boiler was put in. I think with the overlooked fact that it didn't fit the bill. So what we looked at is, can we put in some propane boilers that can provide the boiler reset 
different levels of heat, maybe 180, 160, 140, 120, and 110 to provide the, co the comfort. What we find, if we put out that, if we don't use boiler reset and put out different uh, stages of water temp, this building here will heat up much quicker than the other end and we get inconsistencies. That's why the boilers are gonna fail prematurely is we had to provide some boiler reset temps. That causes condensation. Condensation is acidic. That's a, that's a uh, mild steel tube boiler. It can't take the acidic nature of what we've done. But we had to do it or we wouldn't have building comfort. You made a good point. It just doesn't fit in this case. And the question about propane, I'll let our engineer speak to, I think. Would you like to? Sure. It's not a total surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, this, uh, I guess what the plan is, you have a biomass boiler, a wood boiler, and we have uh, most likely two smaller propane fired boilers that are used for backup if the biomass were to go down, and in those very early seasonal months. So, you know, a very small percentage of your annual heating is actually being done by propane fired heating equipment. Uh, there is a uh, the ignition source, when you first light a, boil, a wood boiler of this size, is usually a propane-fired pilot or a gun to, to get the wood going. And once it's going, it shuts off. You know? So that's kind of your, it's not a spark ignition like the oil burner in your house or something like that. So that's what, you know, there is a, a propane connection to the biomass boiler, but it's just for that startup period. Once you light the boiler off in November or October, whenever it is, it stays on all season and you don't use any of that propane. So during the summertime for hot water, they use the propane or they use the wood burners? Pro, uh, summertime would be propane fired for the domestic hot water for, you know, uh, sinks and showers and that type of thing. So is that included in the cost too, on what the cost would be? There is. Is that whole total cost thing? Whole total, so during yeah. the summertime to keep hot water going through the building, use the propane, so. Yes. Uh, the question is, is the cost of the domestic hot water included in the project cost? And uh, it is, and I think the, the plan is, unless I'm, I haven't been heard lately, is that you have existing water heaters there that are oil fired, and they, they, those would be retrofitted to the propane fired, those water heaters. So those would be, you need new boiler heaters also then? I or think when you said retrofitted, I assume that you could just, you could change it, you right. could keep the original uh, boilers there and just, uh, Convert it to, from oil to gas, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's the intention is to keep keep the water heaters, the right, that's the right what they are called, yeah, to, to convert them from oil to gas. Yes. Are there any systems that use this type of oil at any schools or businesses that use this type of oil? So the question is, examples of other uh, wood chip fired boilers and uh, to help reject the longevity. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Um, we didn't count Can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. I'm real close. Is it not working? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? There you go. So uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, there's several schools, probably at least 20, 25 schools that are using wood chip fired boilers right now. They've all been installed in the last five, seven years. We've toured some of them. Um, it works very well. Additionally, uh, longevity-wise, um, at Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton, I installed or we installed a Wichita fired boiler about eight years ago. But they uh, they have two now. The older one is about 23 years old. Uh, so the technology back then isn't as good as it is now. But again, the system is so simple. The longevity is there. So. Um, we have the evidence that the boiler will last that long. So I'm assuming the, the maintenance upkeep is a lot cheaper with these versus the oil oil burns. Maintenance upkeep, wood chip fired versus oil. Yeah. Over life span. Uh, yeah, just to kind of also follow up on the, the last question too. The question is the main maintenance on the uh, oil fired versus the wood fired boilers. The project we're working on, my firm right now, is in. Uh, Jaffe, New Hampshire for Millipore Corporation. If you know that manufacturing site, there's about a thousand people there. They're putting in a 
very similar installation to what you're seeing right here. It's about six or seven times larger on a BTU scale. One of the main reasons they're doing it is they have, I think, 16 or 18 oil-fired boilers in that facility right now, four or five underground tanks. They have three or four full-time, three shifts, technicians running around keeping these boilers going because they can't take them offline ever. They, they, get, they go forever. This plant, the plant, same type of plant here is being designed for zero, you know, full-time operators. The same thing, they want to go in once or twice a day and check it, you know, empty the bins every couple of days. It's a bigger facility because there's more ash coming out. But it's being designed to really reduce maintenance costs uh, and make it, you know, an operator, almost operator-free uh, installation there. Uh, also, just one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we did a big analysis on where to buy wood chips and, and things like that, and there's a, a huge market of wood chips. I don't think you're going to have any problems finding vendors to, to get that. Uh, you know, you know uh, Millifor is not that far away. I would imagine the same vendors, and I know there's a list of them that they'll be bidding out the chips to. They're, they're out there. They're definitely out there. And what's the local school? that has a facility now, it's 10 or 12? Athol has a wood chip boiler, 20 years old. Uh, Briggs Elementary School has a pellet system that is brand new. Yes? I'm sorry, I have a question, Queen today. I've seen some talk, like why are Athol's wood chips almost 70 or over 70? Um, is it per, I don't really know prices. And I've, I've seen quotes here, ours would be cheaper. Why is that? I can, I can take a start at that. You take a start. <laughs> so uh, different equipment, uh, and the older particularly, requires refined chips, very small, very uh, milled, and uh, therefore more costly. Mm -hmm. Our machine's capable of taking full, full tree, tree chips, which is the broadest of the market and at the lowest cost range. So we use $30 per ton. A highly processed or wood pellet might be twice that. Okay. Yes? Uh, could the analysis that was made be made available on the wood chips? Can the analysis that was done be made available? Yes. The study by Wilson Engineering, if you want to leave your email, you can send a, a PDF, or can it be posted on the website? Both. Both. How long has a Keen middle school had theirs going? How long has Keen's project? How many times did they go out and throw paint at the kid here? In the three years. Oh, that's a great question. How often have they had to cycle over to propane from Woodchip at the Keen facility? Uh, Keen Middle School is a beautiful middle school off Maple Street in Keene. It's a LEED certified school that's a central <laughs> boiler plant uh, that heats the elementary school, the roughly 180,000 square foot middle school and the superintendent's office. Um, the outward most uh, place is 500 feet away. Um, now, with that said, how often has it broken down? Not often. How often? Because they use a uniform chip. They pay about $56, but their supplier is about 60 miles away. Our suppliers are 12 miles away, nominally. Three of them, 12 miles away. When you talk about chips, it takes some fuel to chip them up and put them in a truck. But where the money's spent and where we can help our people that do this, creating local economies, creating jobs for our people, is to establish a market that's close to them. Because a big percentage of their, their markup is fuel. And fuel's high right now. So a lot of our people, especially keen, are getting a chip up in New Hampshire 60 miles away. That's why they're paying 56. You can easily imagine that our price for a, like, a likely chip produced is going to be more than marginally less than that. We will be soon finding out, however, our intent is to burn a whole tree chip. Bill, what did you mean by not often breaking down? I'm sorry. Not I didn't finish that, Diane. Thanks scary. for catching me. Thanks for riding the bird on Bill. You just got to do that sometimes. They don't have a lot of breakdowns. They, their chip is uniform. 
They're, they have a measurement system. Uh, chips or elongated chips, as they're called, stringers. They drop right off the rollers onto the floor. There wasn't that many of them, so they got a good uniform chip that's coming to them. They don't want to have a lot of breakdowns. They have a good system. And I think if, if we have a measurement system, and we have no control over that, but there are a lot of measurement systems around, that'd be a good system, good conveyance system. It's all about conveyance. That's just as important as heating the product and making your thermal value. New question. What's the moisture content of the heat uh, chip compared to the moisture content of the full chip, the full size chip that we're going to be? Same as ours. Same as ours. So we, we can take green, we can take green material. 38%, Peter. Nominal. Yes? What's the life cycle on the augers? What's the life cycle on the augers used in the, in the chip transport? Guys, you're taking all my material, Ray. I, I was going to have a nice slideshow and answer all it. Take Why don't you go to the slideshow? You haven't answered Diane's question yet, so I have to look at it ahead of time. Bill, why don't you take your, your slides? I probably should at yeah. this point. Maybe they, answer some, maybe they answer a few things. Would you mind seeing a boring slideshow by Bill? Bill, Bill the geek who gets so excited about these things. We would love it, Bill. <laughs> uh, just a few things. Uh, there was a question about resources. On the back of the table, uh, resources for biomass information and support. The Biomass Energy Resource Center puts out a great guide, uh, especially for what may be an audience of people who might consider themselves lay people when it comes to biomass. Check that out. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff you can understand and answers a lot of your questions. Wood Education Resource Center work out of Princeton, uh, West Virginia. Lou McCreary. The USDA at Ford, he's the bio, he's the Woody Biomass Coordinator, heavily involved in work, heavily, he knows a lot about this. He's in, he's in charge of 20 states uh, from Maine to Georgia. And uh, he's the man when it comes to uh, biomass. Department of Energy Resources, Gordon Boyce in Belchertown, heavily involved in this project. He, he brought this project to me and Ruth initially. Mass Clean Energy Center works, they partner with the DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, a source of funding for our audits, our energy audits, and maybe some future things. Depart uh, let's see, Biomass Energy Resource Center, Templeton Board of Health, Bill Legier is very supportive of our efforts, and I keep him informed. Northeastern Biomass Heating Association, Biomass Thermal Energy Council, Washington, D.C. Some people ask me about the credibility of Wilson Engineering. They were brought to me by Lou McCurry and Gordon Boyce. They do all the engineering studies for, bi for biomass, uh, commercial and industrial. They've done hundreds of biomass all over the country. I'll say more about them. I will say this. Of those last two people, the Northeastern Biomass Heating Association, Dan Wilson, Tom Wilson is the principal, Dan is his son. Dan is the president of that association. I've got a biomass expo I'm going up to see. And with Ruth's permission, maybe I'll make it this year in April. I'm not asking in front of all these people. I'm pressuring the office. Uh, the Biomass Thermal Energy Council of Washington, D.C., they make a lot of the decisions based on the data funded, funded um, the data findings about forest fires, anything forestry. Dan Wilson is the chairperson for that council. So we've got credibility when we talk about feasibility studies and future plan. Also in the back, on the back table is a copy of the feasibility report if you'd like that in hard copy. So um, this is called uh, Bill and Dan's exciting chip adventure. What we did was we, we had uh, the Wilsons take us to a few projects and we had Bob Latour who's a biomass champ, uh, champion, and my, my neighbor, I didn't know, uh, we got to talk one day and we found out we lived within a quarter mile of each other. And uh, Bob took us on a, some pellet boiler installations and a wood chip installation, which is on here. And uh, Tom Wilson took us on some wood chip installations up in Maine. These cover commercial and industrial. So uh, I, I just want to talk about that. And Dan and I went, Dan sends his apologies. He can't be here today. Uh, but he would love to have been here to, to talk about this. So this is the primary bell feed up in Springfield Technical School in Springfield, Vermont. Coming out of the uh, what is a hopper, just the measurement system. So it's an in-ground steel box 
hopper with an, uh, with an auger. Somebody asked about augers. They, they go a long time. You really <coughs> go about 10 years before you have to do some rebuilds, which means replacing some bearings. What you do if you keep these up, uh, they just run and run and run. That's a 12, uh, this is a primary belt feed system that comes from the hopper, delivered to, into a chip feed area, that goes up to the belt feed and up into that boiler, which is about a six. It's probably going to be a little bit bigger than what we have. It's a, and I do say it's a measure spent. So it's a 12-year-old system. They don't have a lot of problems. People also ask me about augers. How new is the auger? Well, we were just up in uh, Keene, and we were able to converse with everything going on. In our boiler room, when boiler number one or two comes on the burner, you can't converse. It's probably about 110 decibels. So our boiler room is generally going to be quieter when we make the conversion. Uh, this is an example of digital boiler output and control displays from 12 years ago. It's pretty sophisticated. You can look at it, run through, reset, monitor any, anything that's going on with emissions, with fuel output, with fuel delivery. So it's, it was kind of neat then. It's still neat to me. And it's getting better. That's a 12-year-old otter. Yeah, they got some cords wrapped around it, but it is chugging away. It's as quiet as a new one. One thing uh, Dan would say, and I'm going to say this on behalf of Dan, that these guys love their boilers. They don't spend a whole lot of time. They rake them out in the mornings. They, put, they contain their ashes. And they go on there, out there, cleaning the hallways and doing their thing. Some of these guys are master plumbers. Some of them have boilers certified uh, technicians. A lot aren't. A lot aren't. It, it's a very tactile. It's a very tactile uh, operation. It's hands on. Next one's Oxford Comprehensive School in Oxford, Maine. Tom Wilson took us up. That's a Beesman 4.0 million BTU unit. It's not too big. It's a great unit. It's a very sophisticated unit. It's a clean burning unit but it's not a domestic unit. I'd love to see a domestic product come in. I don't know, call me made in America. I'm not on board in England, but I'd, I'd like to see uh, a domestic product. But that's a great product. This is a chip house, and this is a raker system. We talk about an auger fed system. This is a raker feed system. Uh, we're standing right on it. It's running. It uses a system of rams, which you'll see, which will run rails coming out from the rams in the same direction. Series of perpendicular amount of breakers every three feet grab the chips as they move away from the rams. And the, when you pull back, it just pulls the bottom of the pile into a trough where they're distributed, much like an auger would do. But it's safe enough to stand on. The trucks can actually drive over the top of it and deliver their chips. <coughs> We're standing on the raker system. You can see the uh, opposed rails right there as they move the chips. That small hydraulic pump, which is no bigger than, I don't know, a trash disposer. It's just, it's like two feet by two feet, and two and a half feet high, moves tons of chips for years trouble free without using a lot of energy. So that's exciting technology. It may be more expensive. Remember, we're trying to put in an efficient product. That's a modern Beesman digital display. You do a lot more set points, do a lot more with it monitor a lot more operations. Uh, you'll find a lot of our, a lot of the things we measure against, our emissions, what we're allowed for emissions, what we're allowed for, for efficiencies, come from Europe. Germany is a leader in this, and boy, I'd start World War IV if I said that in the middle of a European conference, but Germany does have the best emission standards, and we borrow a lot of them here. You'll see a lot of them in the DOER funding requirements for grants we put out for that we're going to have to follow. These are the hydraulic rams at Oxford. Uh, you see the size of those. They're about six inches in diameter. This is a commercial setting. A school isn't a big thing. It's not a big, huge uh, area of thermal mass being generated. You'll see larger as we go. This is Pleasant View Nurseries near Manchester, New Hampshire. This is an example of, of uh, let me back up. I want to say something about Gary Marshall up there at Oxford. There's a guy that's 68 years old. He's still doing what I do, and he loves it. He's an advocate for education, kids, and bringing facilities and education and kids together. 
And he just can't talk enough. He loves his system. It's his baby. It was a pretty new system, and he was so proud of it. So if you're ever, ever up there, I don't care if it's a Sunday, he'll probably invite you in. So this is a live floor delivery. This is a floor that has a moving floor, much like that brake system and live floor system you saw in the, in the chip house from Oxford. What uh, is happening here is the floor moves, and the chips come out like a big sausage if they're wet. These are a little drier. They come out like a big sausage and lay in place almost. The drier they are, the more they'll spread out. This commercial uh, entity heats a half million or more square feet of greenhouse. Now, now, how much thermal value do you think it takes to heat a greenhouse in New Hampshire in winter? You say, that's crazy. But it's th the thermal and static value that a large enough boiler will put out. They stay hot. So they keep this thing in a 200 by 100 foot enclosure, and they keep their chips, and they move them by loader. That's the size. I would be <laughs> really little next to that. That thing is 50 feet high, 20 feet in diameter, and it is uh, their thermal storage. We're going to have thermal storage, but I'm just telling you about the scale of some of these projects. You can see the size of the industrial rams. That's Dan down there talking to the uh, talking to the proprietor of this, of this business. Now, this business was going out of business. He had no way to continue in business in New Hampshire, and he didn't come up with a solution. He was moving. Now he's, he's staying in New Hampshire. Another reason that biomass creates local economies. So I'll show you right now what a shaker table is. You'll see that foremost yellow projection coming up to the left of that is a shaker table. Some of you say, how are we going to burn whole tree chips? This is the strategy. The table vibrates from side to side. And anything that's too big to pass through the belt system and eventually end up in the boiler goes right across the shaker table and right up to the outside into a bin. That's one way we can separate. So there are, there are strategies for, for burning whole tree chips. And, th and that's it. So I hope I answered some of those questions. We're certainly up to answer any more. Thank you. I didn't do that well. Yeah. I think they want me to sit down. <laughs> there is one question that wasn't asked here today, but I, I want to answer, and it, it gets to what you were saying. Um, the boilers are at the end of their life. I mean, that's clear. We're going to have to do something. And so a lot of people look at that $500,000 figure and say, wow, that's a much better deal than, you know, $2.9 million. <coughs> However, the tax impact to the taxpayers will be greater if we move forward with a $500,000 um, install. And the reason for that is that we would not have the oil savings to pay for it, and we'd have to go to the towns for debt exclusion to actually, both Phillips Finn and Templeton, to actually fund a, five, a half a million dollar boiler because um, and in addition to that, so you'd have that debt exclusion and you'd also have to continue to pay for the increased and the fluctuation in oil that has been demonstrated and the resources that we provided you will also demonstrate. So we're going to have to increase our budget on an annual basis more for the oil while at the same time you'd have to cover a debt exclusion for the half a million. And if we could get an MSBA grant that might cover 60% of that, but that's still another two to three hundred thousand to to make the transfer, and we'd still be dependent on oil. Can we go real quick? Can you give us that one number? Uh, presently, what we're paying for oil now a year versus what was the cost yes, to have this in? I had the number at the beginning, and I couldn't remember whether it was within the present cost of what we're paying. It is, now. It, it, it is it's actually, within that. So it's actually we're going to be paying less a year with taking out the bond correct. and so forth versus correct. what our oil costs will be, say, next year. Correct. It, okay. it definitely is. And what we've tried to do um, with the numbers is we've tried to be have all the highest numbers out there. Right. You know, so I, I told Lori Lombard, who is the financial person that um, has did the loans for us, I, I told her, take a really realistic, a high 
percentage rate. You know, so we might get a lower percentage rate. And, uh, but these are the, see down at the bottom, FY13 and 14? Obviously, it was a really cold winter this year. Right. But that's the other thing. That's if you ask generated. what happens if it costs more. Well, it cost us a lot more than we had budgeted this year. I think we had budgeted maybe um, 250, uh, 250,000. Well, what we had to do was we cut back on other things that we had planned to spend in our budget to cover that number. We didn't go back to the town. And that's the same kind of thing that we would do if for some reason there was a, a year that just cost us more. We've been doing that annually, but we also get bids out. Um, so we would, if we had gone out for a bid for oil this year, we would already know what a locked-in price is that we would set it at. So I hope that clears that up a little yeah, bit. The main thing is that it's going to be a fixed price for 20 years, 25 years first. Oil's going up, it, that, that's going to increasingly going to be going up, which is already higher than what the payment will be to have this all installed. So Correct. we actually have a fixed idea of what this one cost is going to be for the next 20 years, 25 years. Right, right. And it won't be more than what we've already been paying, but Correct. we do know the oil will go up. And that's why the answer to the half a million dollar replacement yeah. for an oil burner we'll makes more. no sense. Diane, so, did you so have a question? For, for two years, are you saying that you've gone over mm -hmm. budget for oil? Yes. How much? Um, I mean, is that, you're saying FY14 is almost 100,000 more? Well, uh, I think she's talking 13 is 250. It's, yeah. it's, it's, we've, we've gone, it's not, I don't, we're not 100,000 over budget, but we're like, we're projecting that we're going to have to have two extra truckloads, which is how much they'll truckload bill? Well, the truckload is 20,000 gallons. 20,000 gallons. At, well, round it up to $3 a gallon. Three dollars a gallon. What is that? Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand. Okay. So, so an extra hundred twenty. Yeah. So, it, and, and this is why this isn't an exact science. You, we had some really warm winters. We were lucky when we put the roof on. We were lucky we got the roof in in the dead of winter. So, it, it's really it's a moving target. But with the projections of oil, we know it's going to increase. And so, we're, I just wanted to clear that up. We're in a cycle now, which is more like the 1970s. Actually, it's going to be. This is just a touch of what's going to be happening over the next five years and winters. I believe it's gradually going to be getting worse before Correct. the next cycle. The projections show that it will get worse. Does anyone else have any questions? Julie. I'd like to thank you for doing this presentation. There's a lot of good information here. I have uh, a couple of questions. It looks like you've done a homework as far as the projections go for the costs. My question again is if one of those projections if for some reason, any reason at all, those projections aren't the same, and the savings aren't realized, how do you pay for that? Do you pay for that? Well, it's the same. Okay. Um, the question is that if for some reason our projections aren't realized, who pays the debt? The debt gets paid out of our budget. So, uh, I, and it's, it's really, I don't know what you're trying to get at. We're going to have locked in figures. We have overestimated everything. We have put a fixed cost on the oil. So we said, this is the dollar amount we're going to be able to, we're, next year the oil price is going to be higher, the year after that. How would we pay for that additional cost of oil if we stayed on oil? Well, we pass it through on our budget to the towns. We don't have a way of raising money. So I think looking just at that piece in isolation isn't a really good way of looking at it. I think you have to look at the whole picture of when oil prices go up, how does how do we pay for that? I, I totally understand okay, thank you. about oil prices going up. So the answer to my question is the debt would be passed on to the town if for any reason we are able to make not, I, no, I did not say that. Did you want to? I, I think that that's sort of what I was asking is, I'm sorry, what was your budget for oil this year? So we put in, um, give me a, I don't remember what it was. I thought you said I it. Was it Yeah, I thought I said, but I, and that might have been just for the, you know, um, middle and high school. Let's say I, uh, my budget was $300,000 this year. And you've gone over that already. It's really 350000 So did you come, did you go no. back to the town and say, 
I want, I, we need another $40,000 for oil? What no. Did, how are you paying for that? No, I, I, we're, we didn't buy other things. So if the savings were not realized, you would not be coming back to the town to say that you want the money to pay right. the loan? Is, I, I think that's what I was getting to, but I didn't say that. Right. Kind of no, right. so we would, asking. right, exactly. We would, on an so annual time. basis, on an annual basis, we would project a budget and we live to that budget as we do every single year. So that, I guess that's the question if you're looking annually. The other question I had was about renewable energy credits. No energy credits on this. Any other questions? Mr. Bramble? If someone asks you about the availability of wood chips in the future, I ask them to take a small plane up and fly around this area for about 30 minutes, and you'll never ask that question again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Bill, can you share with them what you said to me about um, the USDA and why they, they gave us the grant out here? Can you give them a yeah. quick overview? Because this is, I mean, we got this grant because of the area we live in. The USDA uh, came out, DCR came out, and they began looking very demographically at us. Yeah. The cold, hard stare. Looked at satellite imagery. They looked at the data they've been keeping for 100 years. And they came to the conclusion that there's no lack of biomass out here. But there are a lot of vendors who are burning a lot of diesel, delivering chips to a market that isn't anywhere near them. Yet, we do have some biomass installations in the area. So there was interest. They also looked at our economic impact. And they realized that local economies are a dire issue in this, in this area. Looking at all that, and they also found out we put up a 1.65 megawatt, megawatt, uh, megawatt, 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 megawatt turbine. And they said, we have a customer here. So they came out to see us. Uh, and I'm glad they did. And I know that the Bob Latour, uh, because he got them down to see me. Uh, I, that's probably enough said, but they're very interested. They have a vested interest in forestry management forestry projects and people that work in the forestry industry and have a really vested interest in education. This is a really good fit for us, the educational opportunities here for our students, once they become engaged, are, are great. All right, well, thank you all for coming, and we will get um, the information up on the website. I appreciate all the questions and your time that you spent to be informed. Thank you. Thank you.